my story starts in a speech that I went to attend that was given by a, big, a president of Europe in a big multinational company in Switzerland. So not unlike this event, um, but with less jokes and much better cheese. And um, at the end of this event, he stood up to his people, and he said, in what he thought was an inspiring way, from now on, we'll have to learn to do more with less. And you could see that he meant that to be encouraging and exciting and an invigorating call to the future. And I, behind him, looking at their faces in the audience, could see they had absolutely no idea about what this meant, except perhaps they might have to work a little bit later on a Tuesday night. And this is a kind of a theme, and it's clearly less is sometimes about money, absolutely, but it's also about resource, it's about time, it's about all sorts of constraints that are key definers of the world we're moving into. And I'm going to suggest to you that constraints have a bad reputation. If we were to do some free association now about things you would associate with constraints, uh, they would emerge as things that limit us, that make us less than we can be, that restrict our ability to be all that we'd like to do and be. But that, in fact, I would suggest to you, as we know, in certain pockets of what we do professionally, constraints are actually the, limit, the, the spurs to greatness, to breakthrough, and our ability in the future to learn how to make constraints beautiful is going to define our happiness and progress in business, in life, and indeed as citizens of the planet. And we need to learn to get better at it, and we need to create a capability that we can transfer and pass on. I, in my case, to my children, but also with the company that I've uh, been part of for a long time, and a new venture that I'm doing with a gentleman in the front here, David Hicks, which is exploring this as a methodology with other kinds of companies. So I'm going to give you a sense of what it's about and why it's interesting, I think, in two different parts. The first part, we'll just look at a very simple kind of overview of three key parts of how one makes constraints beautiful. And secondly, I'll try and offer some thoughts about for a creative business and for an independent creative business that wants to try and uh, offer something that the big establishment, complacent, incumbent players perhaps can't or aren't interested in offering, what might it mean for us as a piece of stimulus? So the same month as I saw uh, this president of Europe stand up and talk about do more with less, I also went to see this guy speak um, on a, a stage in London. And he was just launching his first film, A Single Man. He's Tom Ford, of course. And he was being interviewed on a stage like this, and he was sitting down. He was being interviewed by... Uh, the film critic of the Times of London. And um, it was a very gushing journalist. She was clearly deeply in love with him, as was all of the audience, and quite rightly so. And he was, he was a model of charm and charisma. He was sitting back, classic kind of alpha pose, hands behind his head, beautifully unbuttoned, very stimulating, very articulate, very funny, just, you know, a genius at, at, at play. And then she finished asking him these gushing questions and then threw the questions open to the crowd and said, any questions? And I put my hand up. And he said, yes, bloke at the back. And I said, I've heard, Mr. Ford, that you describe your catwalk shows as filmic. What have you learned from the world of fashion that you've applied to film? And what have you learned from the world of film you've applied to fashion? What was interesting was his body language completely changed. He, he went from this big, expansive, confident. He literally closed up. So he, he, he leant forward like this, and he put his hands together, clasped his hands together. And he said, what you have to understand is that in a catwalk show, you have 13 minutes. And he repeated it, 13 minutes. He didn't say roughly quarter of an hour or not very long. He said 13 minutes. And in that time, he said, you have to convince a very cynical, seen-it-all audience that your vision is the most exciting vision that they have seen this year in Milan or Shanghai or London or New York or wherever you happen to be. And you've got Anna Winter in the front row, and you've got everybody waving at their friends and checking their texts and reading their computers. And, you have to convince them that yours is the most exciting vision they've seen. So you have a very, very clear sense of what that vision is, and you have to tell it in a really exciting way. Boom, act one, he said. Out you come. And you turn the music up, and you turn the lights down. Boom, act two, on you go. And then he said the most extraordinary thing. He said, my ambition, by the end of that 13 minutes, is to get the entire audience breathing in and out at the same time. I will know that my catwalk show has been a success if as the last Romanian size zero leaves the stage, I can hear the, I can hear the entire audience exhale at the same time. And I was really blown away by this. 
because of the constraint that clearly emotionally kind of distressed him when he first started talking about it and how easy it would have been for him in that situation to say, what can you do, really? You've got 13 minutes, you've got nuclear winter in the front row, all of these people think they've seen it before, so you do your best. He didn't do that. He didn't lower his ambition because of the constraint. Instead, he increases the level of his ambition to an almost ludicrous degree. And it's the tension between that heightened ambition and that significant constraint that creates Boom Act One, that creates this wonderful drama of his runway shows. So I thought that's really interesting, isn't it? And it kind of stuck with me. And you, as, as all ideas do, you start to germinate it. And I just started to notice in popular culture just a sequence of stories about the relationship between ambition and limitation. So uh, on the left-hand side, you'll know the story, I'm sure. John Lasseter talking about the origins of the very first film, long film, Pixar ever did. In the early days of CGI, the problem with CGI that they had was it made everything look a bit plasticky. So they sat down and said, how can we overcome this constraint, this problem? And the answer was, well, let's do a film about toys, because they're supposed to look plasticky anyway, so it'll be great. They'll look really good. So that's why their first film was about toys, because of the constraint of CGI that they had. In the middle, you'll know, I'm sure, that the reason Google's homepage looks the way it is is because in 1998, that was the limit of Larry Page's coding ability. All he knew how to do was put a search box in and a name on the top, and he couldn't afford to subcontract it to anybody else. So they came up with this very simple kind of home, home page that was very different from the loud, noisy home pages of AltaVista or Lycos or Yahoo or all those other kinds of people. And he put his first female engineer, Marissa Mayer, on and said, don't let anyone mess with that simplicity. We really like it. And of course, that's not why Google has been as successful as it is. But it was a part of what made them different initially. And on the right-hand side, the most famous and popular and... Um, yeah, charismatic um, entertainment property in the biggest entertainment category in the world is, of course, Mario. And the reason Mario is the way he is was because of the relationship between the constraint and the ambition. The uh, creator of Mario, you might well know, um, who is now one of the joint CEOs of Nintendo, um, wanted to create the first character-driven video game. And his idea, of course, was a love triangle between a man, a woman, and a gorilla. Uh, that became known as Donkey Kong. The trouble was, to create a character-driven drama, he had to operate in 8-bit technology. And 8-bit pixelation, at the time, looked like this. But it's got to be a character. So he thought, well, I'll put a really big nose on this little guy. But still, you couldn't see where the nose ended and the chin started. So I'll have to put something in between those two to show where one stops and the other starts, so he created a moustache. And hair was way too difficult, so he put a hat on him. And to show where the arms ended and the body started, he put him in a boiler suit. And the whole story about the plumber was a backstory to explain an Italian plumber why he looked the way he did, why he had a moustache and why he had a boiler suit. So this wonderful, engaging character, still, you would argue, the most recognizable and loved character in video games, came from the constraints of 8-bit pixelation at the time. So in each of these cases, you've got a big ambition and a significant constraint. And it's the combination of those two things that creates this fresh, new, exciting possibility that nobody else has really seen before. The limitation in each case is the impetus for a better outcome. And we as creative people and members of creative organizations, as we all are, we know this at some point in certain bits of our organization. It was David Ogilvy who famously said, creativity is about latitude within limitations. I used to be an advertising agency planner. Part of my job was to help define the brief. Ogilvy again famously said, give me the freedom of a tight brief. And part of any creative act is to define the parameters in which that creative act is going to generate ideas, isn't it? You can't start with a completely blank page. It's an absolute bloody nightmare. You need some parameters around the problem to help you get to somewhere focused and interesting. But we don't tend to think of constraints as being useful or valuable in other parts of our business life. We complain about our lack of resource. We complain about our lack of time. We complain about bigger budget constrictions that our client is giving us, or if you are the client, where the world has put you. And it's, I suggest, A, it's time for us to change that, and B, perhaps one of the things that we can offer 
as people who are experts at some level in making constraints beautiful to our clients, to those businesses, is perhaps a broader capability in this area. And that's really what I want to talk about today. This, for instance, is a, an internal designer at Nike who talks very much about um, being very clear about what the problem parameters are. So he says, I always put, literally, I put my designers in a box. I construct a six-sided box in this case. And each of those dimensions you can see is a constraint within which they have to create. That's, that's kind of partly what it's about. Of course it is. Um, so my question then, coming out of this and this realization, as I started my exploration and started to do the kinds of research and the interviews that you do to try and explore an area was, is this nature or nurture? Are there some people who are just brilliant at doing it? Or is it a broader capability that can be learned? And if it can be learned, and it is a broader capability, what are the kind of four or five key elements of it that, that we can all start to appropriate and think about and perhaps just practice more generally in our daily life? And so one of my first interviews was a guy called Michael Beirut, who's a kind of rock star designer at Pentagram in New York. And he clearly is a creative. He works on problems every day for his clients. And I, I, I ventured a very crude, um, very simple hypothesis to him that, in fact, it, it was you know, nature, not nurture. And there were different kinds of people. There were people who were naturally victims of a constraint. And in that situation, as a victim, what you do is you reduce your ambition to fit the constraint. So you lower the level of ambition because the constraint surely is, is insuperable and you, and you therefore have to manage what your expect, expectation should be anyway. There were a second group of people, I thought, who were neutralizers who said, well, let's just find a, a, a kind of way through this. We'll kind of kludge it, as Silicon Valley would say. We'll just kind of find a MacGyver-like quick fix around it. It's not a long-term strategic solution, but it's a way through. And then the third group, much more interesting, I thought, and I thought Michael Beirut might be one of these, who are much more transformative, who actually were able to step back, like Tom Ford, in the face of a constraint, and say, I'm, this ambition is way, way too important for me to reduce it. I might actually try and lean into it even more and see what happens, see what transformative effect happens when I actually combine that heightened ambition with this constraint. And he said, I don't think these are three, three different kinds of people. He said, I recognize, as a creative person, all these three stages in myself. Whenever a client gives me a really difficult, difficult constraint around a business problem, my first reaction is always, the bastards. How the hell am I supposed to work like this? And I get really grumpy, and I stop, stomp around for a couple of days, and my bottom lip goes. And then after a couple of days, I think, hey, wait, 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 wait. Maybe this isn't so bad. Actually, maybe if we do something a bit like we did 10 years ago on that client, and we combine it with something a bit like I was reading about the other day, maybe there's something we could do that might be quite interesting here. And then we get together with the team, and we start to kind of work in a much more cross-functional way, and we get to something really interesting as a result. He said, I think these are stages. They're not people. And the trouble is people get stuck in victim stage. It's very natural. It's going to be the first stage that you, you get to, but people get stuck there. And what people need help in is in working out how you start to create movement beyond that victim stage into starting to see the limitation as a source of impetus and possibility. So that's what um, the book um, tried to do, is trying to do, continues to try to do. That's what the process that David and I are working on with clients like kind of Camelot and Unilever and um, LVMH are trying to do um, and starting to see some really interesting effects with. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about three of the six key um, stages, if you like, uh, today. So the first is really how you frame the question, as I've already intimated, is of course absolutely fundamental here. I, I've sat in, and I'm embarrassed really to admit it now, I've sat in far too many brainstormings where the owner of the problem says, let's take all the constraints out of the room. Let's just imagine we can do whatever we want. And you all come up with all these ideas, and you brainstorm furiously, and you come up with a fantastic variety of possibilities. And then, of course, you bring the constraints back into the room, and 99% of them immediately wither and die. And you can see everybody's body language kind of slumps. And what's interesting, I think, about the breakthroughs that one sees is that actually they come from people who put the constraint right in the middle of the problem, just like Tom Ford did. So let me give you um, an example of somebody who put a constraint into the problem and asked a question a different way and got a breakthrough. So we did some work with Audi of America a couple of years ago, and Scott Kyo, the um, president, was telling me this wonderful story about Audi designing their new Le Mans racing car in the mid-2000s. They had to produce a new car. It's a car company. It's a long-distance endurance race. The only reason to do it is to try to win. So imagine that I am the chief engineer, and you are the engineering team at Audi, and we're trying to sit down and work out what is the starting question for us 
against this brief? How, how do we start to approach this? The natural question for the chief engineer to ask is surely something about speed. It's surely something about how can we produce a faster car? Because that's the way you win races, right? You have a faster car than anybody else. But the chief engineer doesn't start with that question. He says something much more interesting. He says, Audi is all about being progressive. That's what's written over our gates, the factory. That's what we're about as a company. Let's ask a more progressive question. Let's ask the question, how would we win Le Mans with a car that is no faster than anybody else's? How could we win Le Mans, big ambition, with a car that's no faster than anybody else's, significant constraint? He puts those two things together. And we, as an engineering team, find it hard to respond to that because we've been trying to produce faster cars for the past five to 10 years. That's kind of what we know how to do. We know, understand wind tunnels. We understand lightness of carbon fiber. We understand you know, the room vroom engine thing. We understand all of that. But the question he's asked us means we can't answer it by any of our kind of go-to strategies of the last five years. We have to think in a completely different way about what this problem is and how to answer it. And the way they answered it, as you probably know, was to say we can win Le Mans with a car that's no faster than anybody else is if we don't put into the pits as often. Because when you put into the pits, it doesn't matter how fast your car is. I can overtake it, you can overtake it, a snail can overtake it. If we can stay out on the track longer with a car that's just as fast as everybody else is, we'll win. So they introduced diesel technology, seriously, for the first time into long distance racing. This, of course, is the R10 TDI in front of us. Uh, they win Le Mans the next three years, and they're one, two, three on the podium each time. And that came, I suggest, because the engineer asked a fundamentally different question to the engineering team in the first place. We now, because of the way the world moves and how fast it works, we all have a bias to action. We all think, actually, it's all in the doing. We don't stop and think about the question. We don't stop and help the client think about the question enough. And I would suggest there's a construct here, a very simple construct, which you're seeing already, I suppose, in uh, everything from Tom Ford to the Audi example to the um, Toy Story example about actually breakthrough tends to come when you have a bold ambition and a significant constraint in the same question. And if you talk to cognitive scientists, they'll say, um, this creates a lot of discomfort in the brain because these two things shouldn't belong together. So it forces you to process the question differently. A question underlying assumptions you haven't felt necessary to question up to now. If you talk to people on the receiving end of this kind of problem, this kind of question, they don't talk about cognitive processing. They talk about the fact that nothing I've done in the past five or 10 years helps me to answer this. So I have to go to new sources of data new kinds of partners. I have to work with different people in the building, in the company, outside the company I've never worked with before. It pushes me out of my path dependence. So I'm calling it a propelling question because it propels you out of the paths that you've found comfortable and easy and successful up to now. I'm really interested in, in the point, and I, sadly I missed yesterday, about uh, the uh, lady from the headhunting company talking about um, how leaders are not judged on their past now, but they're judged on their ability to be agile in the future. It's the same principle. The thing that has got you where you are today is not going to be the rag bag of solutions and data points and relationships that's going to get you to the future. Propelling question forces you not to comfortably rely on those. It makes you productively uncomfortable. And we as leaders and as companies and as individuals need to ask ourselves and our teams and our companies more propelling questions. So just you know, to put the point about constraints are sometimes about budget, but they're about other kinds of things as well. Let's just look at three examples, and we'll work at, look at what the solutions are in a minute. So constraint of regulation, this is another example from the Audi experience in the US. They needed to launch the new S8. The consumer wouldn't buy it, if it, was faster, unless it unless it was faster than the old S8. And the regulator, the US regulator, wouldn't let them sell it unless it was more fuel efficient. So they needed to produce a car that was both faster and more fuel efficient. Historically, those are things that don't fit well together. You make one or you make the other. They had to do both. How are they going to do that? Propelling question. In the middle, the lack table. Those of you that have been students or have children as students will almost certainly have bought a lack table from IKEA. Their propelling question was, how do we produce a well-designed, lasting table uh, that we can sell profitably for five euros? And the design team who received that had no idea how to do that. They'd never made a uh, table at that price point before. Nobody else had ever made a table at that price point before. 
but they had to do it. We'll talk about that in a minute. And finally, budget. Um, so this is made.com, uh, online furniture retailer, decided they wanted to announce themselves on the global stage by exhibiting at the most prestigious furniture show in the world, which is, of course, in Milan. Um, but the exhibition fees were extortionate. So how do we exhibit at the most prestigious furniture show in the world when we can't afford or don't want to afford the exhibition fees? Each of these, the same thing, a propelling question. Bold ambition, significant constraint. And in case you think I'm kind of retrofitting and force-fitting these, let's just briefly consider one of uh, President Obama's uh, legacy projects that he announced at the beginning of last year before um, leaving the presidency, which was his desire for America to be the first country to cure cancer. He said, I'm going to inject a billion dollars into um, this if, if we can do, make 10 years progress in five years. So it's exactly the same construct. How can America be the first country to cure cancer by significant constraint, making 10 years progress in five years? So what's interesting about all of those questions, of course, is initially we feel like a victim. Bloody hell. Is that even answerable? How the hell would you start to do that? I've got nothing in my armory that will help me do that. So initially, you, like Michael Beirut, we, like Michael Beirut, stomp around. You get a bit grumpy. I'm not sure that can be done. The bastards, all that kind of thing. But the question then is, how do you create a, uh, an environment and a culture of finding answers amongst you and your team? Because clearly, this is not going to be something that any one individual does on their own. That should be, I guess, a pattern that's emerging here. How do you create an environment which is optimistic and positive and confident in that kind of situation? And I spoke to a guy called uh, Colin Kelly, who at the time was the chief technical officer of Warburton's Bakery, which was the largest bakery in the UK. He's now gone on to William Grant, uh, the distillers, to be the chief quality officer there. And he said, I've got a very simple way of approaching difficult questions. I don't allow any, anybody in my team, when we're, when we're tackling a difficult problem, to begin a sentence with the words, we can't do that because. They have to start the sentence, we can do that if. And when I say it to you, it might sound like the kind of glib thing that a, a consultant or an author would say to you on a... Um, you know, a Thursday morning in a lightless room. I have to tell you, it, it's one of the most interesting and insightful things I've heard in the last 15 years. Because let's just think about three things that it does. The first is, it focuses all the energy in the room on, and all the, all the conversation on the, the question we're trying to answer, how can we solve this problem, rather than allowing it to drift into a different question, which is, is this a problem that can be solved? The second thing it does is it keeps optimism alive in the process, and optimism is a thing that decays quite quickly. We think of ourselves as being optimistic. We don't think of the people around us being optimistic. It's, the, it's called the optimism bias. There's an interesting TED talk about it. And you've got to, as a leader, keep optimism in the process. And the third thing is, if you believe that we are the stories, we are as a culture, the stories we tell about ourselves, the story that that sentence tells about ourselves is we are people who find solutions to problems rather than the other story, which is we are people who find reasons why things can't be done. So it's a really important construct, I think. And we were very stimulated by it, my co-author and myself, to say, well, let's look at the 75 case histories that we were kind of studying and saying, could you kind of find a very simple kind of launch pad or template or stimulus out of all those case histories that would create a kind of can-if map that would give us more of an exploration of where to go and, and, and how other people could start. So... Uh, in the spirit of, of sharing um, a kind of a, a thought for you. So let's look at the answers to these three. Uh, in the case of Audi, how did they actually build an engine that could be faster and more fuel efficient? They didn't come from inventing something new. It come from, came from taking three things they already had, uh, lightweight engine technology, a new kind of fuel injection, um, and a new kind of... Um, a uh, kind of turbo system, and combining the three of those for the first time in a way that they'd never tried to or needed to before, and they created this amazing new engine. Uh, in the case of the IKEA table, did anyone know how they did this? It's brilliant. So they, they decided, they found that there was no way to do it with existing table technology, but uh, if you took a similar planar structure, a door, which was produced um, at mass level, and, had, and was kind of much kind of, uh, it was hollower inside, you could take a mass-produced door cut it in half, put four legs on, and sell it as a table at five euros and make a profit. So the lac table is, in fact, half a door with four legs on it. 
It's brilliant. But they would never have got there unless someone had asked them that question at that price point. And nobody's matched them on it since. Uh, Made.com, how did they do that? They, somebody somebody said, said, we must have um, four users, four enthusiastic users who are in, in Milan. Maybe they've got apartments. If they're using us, they've probably got nice apartments. Perhaps they'd be proud to let us use their apartments, one for each of the four days of the show. So we'll exhibit in their apartments, which they did. They put all their furniture in a real Milan apartment. They've got 1,000 people through those apartments in four days. They were the darlings of the press because it was a really interesting story. They positioned themselves as a far more creative, interesting, funky furniture company than any of those people who were using the traditional exhibition halls. They made that constraint beautiful. That constraint propelled them to a better place than they would have been if they could have afforded the exhibition hall in the first place. That's what constraints can do for us. So, very crudely speaking, we've created this CANIF map. This CANIF map essentially looks at a number of different ways in which these 75 different cases seemed to transform that constraint. So, let me give you some examples. So at the top, you can see the lack table. Actually, we can, if we think of this not as a table, but we think of it as half a door. Um, mixing, top left, um, 11 o'clock. We can, if we mix together three things we already have to make something new that we've never done before. Um, oh, if we use other people to do this for us in some kind of way. And I'm not suggesting that any one of these on their own is going to be the silver bullet. If you look, in fact, at Obama and how they think they're going to answer this question, they think three of these different solution types are going to be the way through the combination of those. So they think it partly will be about mixing. People, by and large, in treating cancer, particularly in the States, are not combining treatments. So they're going to do immunotherapy and a cancer treatment at the same time and see if that has an exponentially better effect. In terms of um, accessing the knowledge, one of the things about cancer research, apparently, in the US is it's in silos. The people who are, uh, have done all the work on renal cancer don't share it with the people who've done all the work on throat cancer, don't share it with the people who've done the work on colon cancer. So he's making them break down those such silos and share that knowledge in a much more aggressive way. And finally, in terms of think of it as, you know, what if we think of it as cancer prevention rather than cancer cure? Can we completely flip, you know, the whole paradigm, to use that awful word, um, and make it possible? So I'm not suggesting any one of these on their own is going to be complete, but as starting points, we found it in our work a very useful way to get people who don't think of themselves as creative, client groups, cross-functional client, client groups, sales directors, for instance, to start to see how you can take an apparent limitation and start to look in different kinds of places for answers that might move us forward. And the third strand of the six I just want to talk briefly about uh, is the idea of adjacent abundance, the idea that actually in terms of resource, we have far more resources available to us than we think we do. We just aren't seeing them as the resources that they are. So, for instance, um, just a show of hands. Hands up, those of you in the room that would describe yourselves as entrepreneurial. OK, great. So about half of you. I expect the other half are being too modest, probably, and you probably do think of yourselves as entrepreneurial. That's why you're here, in part. Um, but the interesting question is, if I then asked each of you that did put your hands up, to define what an entrepreneur was, I bet you'd give me a completely different definition of it. It's you know, a combination of agile, self-starter, seeing opportunity, going out there and shaking trees, making stuff happen, lots of different combinations. I'm really interested in, in a different definition, which is the one given by the founding dean of entrepreneurship at Harvard Business School, which is this. He's a man called Howard Stevenson. He said, entrepreneurship is the pursuit of opportunity beyond resources controlled. Pursuit of opportunity beyond resources controlled. So let's just stick with that definition for a moment. So what that means is my resources are not the people that report into me or the budget that I've been given or the time that I personally have. It's what I can access in the pursuit of my goal that other people have and how I access it. So let me give you an example, my favorite example. It's not a particularly new example, but I just love it. So this is the launch of Virgin America and the United States. Uh, back end of the 2000s. They have this fantastic experiential uh, cabin, of course, with the purple mood lighting. They know that it's a trigger to purchase. It's a really interesting big trigger to purchase. If I show you this at the time, and you're fed up with the kind of cattle truck mindset of United or Delta, you'd be really interested in trying this. But 
I don't have the budget to blitz you with a big media budget. And even if I did, the big market leader, Southwest, is spending over 100 million a year on advertising. I can't possibly compete with them. So I've got to find a way of getting other people to show this trigger to purchase visually to their friends and uh, on my behalf. So they do very famously, you might know this, they do a number of things which say, okay, so what have we got here? What we've got, well, we've got, a, we've got an aisle. That could be a catwalk, right? So let's partner with somebody. Uh, let's take a very visually interesting and rich subject. So in this particular case, this is underwear. So this is uh, Victoria's Secret doing a catwalk show. These are technically cabin-appropriate pajamas, if you're wondering what she's wearing. Um, and you can see there's a high degree of interest from the passengers, very high degree of interest in the media. They got other people other people's resources to communicate that trigger for purchase for them. Uh, they did the same in relationships with Google. They did a, an HBO relationship with Entourage, where they premiered a new episode of the new season of Entourage on the plane with some of the stars. They got people to visually show this trigger to purchase for them. And people sometimes say, they're just brilliant at publicity stunts, aren't they, those people? I don't think that's a publicity stunt. It's a brilliant strategic use of other people's resources to tell your story. It's this. It's being an entrepreneur. It's the pursuit of opportunity beyond resources control. And what's interesting about this statement is when he first came up with it and talked about it, he meant small companies, small independent companies doing their own thing up against bigger, more established players. Just compare it with this very famous quote of Tom Goodwin's from two years ago. In 2015, Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's most popular media owner, creates no content. Alibaba, the most valuable retailer, has no inventory. And Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. Four of the most successfully disruptive brands and companies in the world are obeying exactly that same definition of entrepreneurship. This is not about small, funky businesses anymore. This is the way that big, game-changing businesses are working. And I wonder if, I certainly wonder if my clients really get that. I don't think they do. And I really wonder if us, as catalysts to those clients, are really embracing it as well. How much of you really talk seriously and strategically to your clients about this? How can we access, how can we help you access other people's resources on your behalf, on this opportunity's behalf? Is that a capability you have as an organization? Is that a capability you promise in a pitch? You could do th things, I think, that the big incumbents are not doing if you were to lean into some of this. So, I think this is really about inventiveness rather than innovation. I think we idolize innovation too much, and I think this is about a different kind of creativity, which is inventiveness. Innovation tends to sit in a, in a department over here. There's a few people, very clever people, um, probably uh, really young people who do this, and they're gonna come up with something that's gonna change the world and make our fortunes, and we're just gonna wait until they come up with that. And when it does come out, it'll be great, and we'll launch it for them. But inventiveness is not about that. Inventiveness is something we can all do, any department can do. We can lead, we can encourage, we can create as a capability, and that's our jobs as leaders. And frankly, that's one of the advantages that we as creative companies can offer and have if we take it out of the tiny little slice of creativity that we're currently offering, if we make it a broader perspective on the world and on life. So at its very simplest, I would say to you, from this idea of making constraints beautiful, let's at the very least start to think about constraints differently. Merely asking the question, when faced with a constraint of time, or budget, or resource, or talent, how can we make this constraint beautiful, will already start you thinking and progressing in a different way towards a different kind of solution about it. But what if, so at the very least I think that's, that's good and that's encouraging, and I, and I do think, though, that there's a bigger possibility for us here as creative people. And I just want to explore that for the next 15 minutes before we take some questions and answers. I wonder whether coming out of that initial thought about we all have to learn to do more with less is a possibility for us as businesses or group of businesses. Is there in here the DNA of, of the future of business more generally and therefore the future of our businesses? So let's take a very simple example. So I'm going to lean, I suppose, on my past and my past uh, is got to have oh, you know, one very large foot in a company called Eat Big Fish, um, which is specialized in challenges and helping challenges succeed, and saying, well, let's just look at that. Let's just look at how one helps challenges succeed. Is there a, 
a, a kind of a, a way in which you can ask the question about how can a challenger make more impact with less budget. And if I was to start a kind of communications company or an advisory company, and I, and I don't, we're just a kind of consultancy, we don't do solutions, how would that make me think about what capabilities I ought to be developing and offering, what kinds of new departments I might have? So just humor me while I play this out. And I'm going to suggest that if we were to explore this, there's kind of five things you seem to see happening, really, about how challenges make more impact with less budget. And they're all different kinds of can if, right? So a challenger can make more impact with less budget if. And the first is about drama. It's about drama. So let me tell you a story. Uh, last year, I uh, got early to a client meeting. I was working with um, uh, a retail client, and they've got an office near St. Paul's. And I got there a bit early, and it was nearly lunchtime. I knew they wouldn't give me lunch, so I thought I'd better go and find somewhere. I didn't know the area very well. I wandered around, come across this falafel shop called Pilpel. That if you'd been into, it's great falafel. Uh, but I'd never been there before. And it was the light drizzle of a London summer, so there were people waiting outside. So I thought, if you're waiting in the drizzle for falafel, that's probably a good recommendation. So I joined them in the drizzle. And um, I gradually get out the drizzle, and I get up to the front, and I order my falafel, and there's all these falafel fluffers waiting to take my order. So I say, I'll have this, please. And the falafel fluffer is fluffing my falafels. And suddenly, a bell goes. And all these falafel fluffers look up, and they go, hooray! And then they look down again without saying anything and go on fluffing the falafels. So it's, it's a little, little bit weird, a little bit weird, but, but intriguing. So I get my falafel, um, beautifully fluffed, and I go up to the counter, and I pay, and I say, um, just as a matter of interest, the whole cheering bell thing, what's that about? And they said, oh, well, we've got a loyalty card, and here's the card, and it's got 10 different boxes on it. When you've got 10 falafels, uh, then we ring the bell, and everybody cheers, and you get a free falafel. Would you like a loyalty card? Now, I, I quite like falafel but I'm not kind of absolutely hung up on it, and I hardly ever go to St. Paul's. My chances going to Pilpel 10 times are very, very small, so of course I said yes. <laughs> who, who doesn't want to get gonged, right? We all love it. You'd like, I mean, if I give you a chance of being gonged, you're going to take it. So what I think is brilliant about this is they've created a tiny piece of drama around a really cliched thing, a loyalty card, and they've created this little emotional connection that I wouldn't have had with them or it before. Here I am telling 200 complete strangers uh, about it. You'll tell a couple of other people about it. It might be the one story that you remember from what I tell. They've just created a little bit of drama, and they've created this emotional connection to something new. And I'm interested in drama because our sad little secret, ladies and gentlemen, is we are all today drama junkies. We are all hooked on drama. If you go home in the evening and you say to your partner, and your partner says to you, honey, what happened today? The first thing you will tell them is not the most important thing that happened. It's the most dramatic. Oh, my God. Julian stole my bloody parking spot again. I can't believe it. He's always doing that. That's not the most important thing that happened. It's the most dramatic thing that you want to communicate. Really? Yes. You know, you get into this whole little kind of drama ritual that we all go through. That's what we're hooked on. We're hooked on drama. And that's very exciting for us as creators of drama if we think of ourselves as creators of drama, because we can create social currency, little moments, a gong, to much bigger moments for our clients and for ourselves. There's a piece of film I'm about to play now, which is of one of the kind of poster children of drama today. Uh, you'll know all about them, I'm sure. It's a very famous company now called Brewdog. We were lucky enough to interview them in the very early days when they were just starting out. So this is James Watt, the co-founder, talking before they became a billion um, pound company, as they just were valued, about how they started and how they used drama to get their word out. Can we play the film? Sorry. Can we play the film? We set up with no money, with no budget, and the beard industry, marketing, is traditionally all about advertising. It comes back to how much money you've got. And what we've tended to do is focus on social media and online platforms. If you go online, it's not about budget. It's about your ability to connect with your customer. It's about how intelligent, how engaging your content is. We've also focused on doing kind of edgy, slightly provocative PR. But they've all been done because it gives us a platform to get our ideas across about beer. So we made a 18.2% beer called Tokyo. There was a huge media backlash. 
I was in Channel 4 News, I was interviewed by loads of major newspapers, and the people that saw that coverage, maybe it just gets them starting to think, well, beer doesn't have to start with Heineken and end with Stella. There is maybe a different approach to beer and get them into good beer that way. So um, I don't think he's talking about social media at all there. He's talking about drama, isn't he? He's talking about the selective use of drama. We probably have social media functions. We shouldn't have social media functions. We need a drama function. If you're producing drama, social media is an absolute doddle. Once you've got the channels right, we're thinking of it the wrong way around. And with drama comes surprise. Um, some of you will know, of course, uh, this wonderful story. I think it won something at Cannes a couple of years ago, a pop-up restaurant in uh, Stockholm called Dill. Sold out for three months, uh, very popular. You couldn't get a table to save your life. At the end of the three months, it closes down like pop-up restaurants do, and it is revealed that Dill is um, uh, an anagram of uh, Lidl, the discount retailer, and all the food uh, that was cooked in Dill came out of Lidl. Shock all over Sweden. Oh, my God, I didn't realize this, you know, um, overlooked little kind of uh, shop in the corner there could produce such delicious stuff. They are masters of surprise. In fact, the whole strategy in the UK is, of course, all about surprise. Uh, the other example I love here is of uh, Lewis Road Creamery in New Zealand, which produced a chocolate milk that sold out very quickly. They produced a new uh, stock of chocolate milk that people started fighting over in supermarkets. So they introduced security guards by the chocolate milk aisle in the supermarket to stop people fighting for it in an unseemly way. Now, when was the last time you saw security guards standing over chocolate milk in your supermarket? You never have. It's a bit of a surprise. And from the point of view of strategic discipline, drama and surprise are really important because they do a number of things that nothing else really offers. First of all, they demand attention. In a continuous or partial attention world, where we're all checking our phones all the time and doing other things, it commands that I actually look at you. Secondly, it creates memory structures. If you read Byron Sharp and you talk about how brands grow, he talks a lot about memory structures and memory associations. It creates an instant memory association. It demands an emotional response. You have to react to it in some kind of way. You can't allow it to slip over you. And it's a much higher inclination to create word of mouth. So drama and surprise are things that should be strategic disciplines for us rather than accidents of a big idea. We should be writing in that desire and intent with our clients. We should be creating them much more systematically in the supermarket aisle and in every active communication that we do. So we can if, drama and surprise. Second can if is we're interesting on the inside. Um, so interviewed um, Stephen Grass, who created Hendrix Gin and Sailor Jerry. He talks a lot about if you have a very restricted budget, you have to be interesting on the inside. You have to be something that people want to engage and indeed want to talk about on your behalf for you. So he talked a lot about the fact that Sailor Jerry was a brand that grew from naught to 500,000 cases without any advertising at all. Uh, uh, I think Hendrix grew to 400,000 cases in the same kind of way. He says when we create a product, because he is creating these products uh, either for himself or indeed for uh, William Grant in Hendrix's case, when we create a product, it needs to be as interesting on the inside as it is on the outside to give people lots to write about. If you look at Hendrix, the bottle is interesting, the liquid's interesting, the whole story adds up. It can't just be window dressing. He talked a lot about his most uh, recent enthusiasm, uh, which was a brand with the snappy name of Art in, Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, um, which is based on a story which I won't go into now. But he says, you know, we created three flavors. Uh, each of them had a story behind them. Rhubarb, for instance, uh, Ben Franklin bought rhubarb to the US. He gave the seeds to his friend, who was the king's botanist. They made tea out of them. That's a story that everybody loves. That's really interesting. I'm not selling flavors. I'm selling stories. I'm selling interesting stories. We are all storytellers, but we're limiting where we tell that story and what that story is and the business application of that story to a certain slice of our creativity. Our clients, our clients' businesses need much more of that, much more pervasively. We're just not offering it, and they don't see it yet. We need to help them see the world differently, as Daniel would have said. Fourth, we can if we make our secondary medium the primary medium. If we can't afford the, big, afford the big dollars or the big medium, we need to make the secondary medium the primary medium. So this is of a project that um, we, Big Fish, worked on with a, with a designer. Um, it took effectively a, a, a high-end ready meal brand called Charlie Biggums, 
which was about to be delisted in Waitrose, which is the upmarket retailer in the UK, as you might know. Uh, people said there's no role for it. Uh, we can't see why we need it on the supermarket. We created a very clear role, which was about two people reconnecting over food. Um, and a couple that effectively has had the twinkle in their eye when they first got together and now lost that twinkle because they're overrun by life, business, and children, reconnecting. And we said, well, let's put that usage occasion on the front of the pack so we don't have advertising. The food shot will be on a flap underneath. So here are this couple. Uh, they're called Peter and Emily. He's making bad jokes. She's pretending to laugh at them just as she did when they first started going out. Um, uh, she's wearing a bit too much cleavage. He's making too many jokes. He's wearing his best glasses. They've got a bottle of wine on the table. Something might happen tonight. That is the promise of that particular pack. That has gone from 3 million in sales to 65 million in sales in seven years. In seven years. Why? Because they made the secondary medium the primary medium. And also, they were pretty clear about what they wanted to be. And finally, the point I talked about before, which is we can if we use other people's resources. So made.com learned from the um, Milan experience, and they now have uh, other ways of using their users' experience in terms of user-generated content. So if you've gone to Made, for instance, there's a, a page on it called Made Unboxed, which is when you've bought your made piece of furniture or your sofa or your table, you can take a photograph of it, beautifully art-directed, of course, in your own home and upload it onto the Made site so everybody else can see what it looks like in the real environment. So it's fantastic for Made because they don't have to take photographs of their furniture in real retail environments because other people have done it for them. It's fantastic for the potential purchaser because you can see what it looks like in a real environment. And it's great in terms of that community because it bonds all of them together. They're using other people's resources to get ahead. So this is really the, the point for us. Let's imagine this grid. I'm going to ask you to do two things mentally. So you can see that in the middle is 0, at the end is 10. Just at some point today, just draw this grid out for yourself and say, how good am I, how good is my company on my client's behalf, or indeed for me, in doing each of these five things? And if you want to, you can put drama and surprise together. I think they're different, but you can put drama and surprise together. How good are we at doing those five things? Because that's what it takes to be successful in communications on a small budget, or a very limited budget, or no budget, actually. And the second thing is, more ambitious question is, if we think that's important and valuable to our clients, what would it mean to restructure our business to offer that more systematically? So I wouldn't have a social media department, for instance. Uh, I might have an interesting on the inside um, department. I might have a drama and surprise department. I might have somebody who specialized in accessing other people's resources on behalf of my problem. Who would that be? How could I access it? How would they make it worthwhile for those other resources to partner up with us. There'd need to be some kind of commercial innovation partnership that went on there. Who would I find who could do that? I think there's a lot of opportunity for us. I think there's a really exciting future. But I wonder whether it requires us to take what we're good at doing a particular bit of our business, making a, a particular kind of constraint beautiful, a packaging constraint or an advertising constraint, and making it the future of all business. And going back to the David Ogilvy point about latitude within limitations. I brought 40 books along. I thought they were going to be out today. They were out yesterday, and they've all gone. So I apologize for that. But if you're interested, there's much more in there. Uh, and equally, I sadly can't stay today, but David is going to be around all today. So I'm sure he'd be happy to answer any questions uh, after the break, and so on and so forth. So I think we've got time for some questions. Adam, thanks very much indeed. Absolutely wonderful. Who's going to kick off with a question? Uh, what was the most stimulating constraint you faced in building Eat Big Fish? Ah, can I ask, answer a slightly different question? I've actually, <laughs> I've actually got, well, I've actually got uh, some, a couple of slides on this, so let me just lead it, because it is the question I get asked quite a lot. And so we decided when we launched the book that we would set ourselves a constraint. And the constraint would be, how could we sell 5,000 copies in a month with a marketing budget of zero? Okay, so this is an example of Canif. So um, here we go. 
so we decided, okay, well, it's easy. We'll use other people's resources. We've got friends in advertising agencies. My fellow partner and I, my, my co-author and I used to work in advertising agencies. Uh, so we thought, well, we'll, um, we'll just ask our friends, advertising agencies. They love to throw parties, famously entertaining. They've got clients. It'll be new content for them. So we rang them up and said, look, you've got great environments. Throw us a party. And we want to do it just in the U.S., we want to do parties in San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, and possibly Chicago, all in two weeks. Will you be one of those people who throws a party for us? And we discovered that since we left the advertising business 18 years ago, things had changed. Advertising agencies didn't feel quite as flush as we fondly remembered them as being. <laughs> no, they said, Adam and Mark, we don't have budgets to throw parties anymore. Hmm, OK. So the point about CANIF is very quickly with a CANIF, you hit a block, but you have to keep going. All right. So we can if, so they don't have the budget, but if we get the expensive thing, which is the booze, to them for free, you know, then we can still access their beautiful atrium and their client list, surely. Yes, that's fine. You give me the booze for free. Absolutely. Okay, so now the question is, how do we get the booze to them for free? Well, we have drinks clients. We'll go to the drinks clients and we'll say, will you give us free booze for these parties, these five or six or however many it is parties in the States over these two weeks? Mm, that's not really the business we're in the free booze business. It doesn't work economically to do that. Okay, so no, they don't make their money by giving out free product. So, okay, well, let's think of it in a different way. Let's think of it not as us having a party, but your, the drinks company's, chance to launch a new product amongst some of the most influential, creative, Twitterati in America over a two-week period. How would that be? Yes, says one of our clients, Sky Vodka. That would be really interesting. We've got a new product. It's a way of hacking the uh, kind of cocktail effectively. Um, very simple cocktail making um, uh, thing. So um, it's a Sky cocktail range. They gave us the cocktail. They, they paid for the drink. Uh, they paid for a bar in each venue. This is the bar that they brought along. They gave us a, a, a barman, a cocktail maker. They gave us a brand ambassador. He's Felix. He's the bloke right on the left-hand side uh, with a beard and a kind of wonderful kind of head of hair and this very unbuttoned kind of gold chain look. Everybody loved Felix. He came with us on all, all of the tours. We did um, 12 parties in two weeks in five cities, ending up with Google throwing a launch party for us on the last Thursday when we were in New York. And we sold 5,000 copies in a month. So it's a very long answer to your question. But um, yes, it has utterly transformed the way that I think about business and the way I do my own business. I wish I had thought about it much more in the early days about Eat Big Fish, where I just had a few ideas about how to make a business card different and more interesting and, and noteworthy and a name that stood out, certainly at the time. I wasn't thinking system, systemically about it enough, but I wish I had done. But now it's, it's changed the way I think about business completely, and mine as well. Um, next ball, please. Actually, I'm not sure this is a question. It's more just a share, share of an experience. But um, one of the challenges about getting other people to do things for you, which um, obviously is behind the, the answer to the, to the last question, it just reminds me of um, when we first started to work in China. And uh, we went to Chinese agencies and uh, companies that we'd met and said, um, you know, who do you most respect? And the agency that they named was, was not Ogilvy or... Mikau or any of these people, it said, um, oh, we most respect um, Milton Kotler. I thought, Milton Kotler? That's really strange. Is it something to do with Philip Kotler? And they told the story, and the story was um, that Milton Kotler is actually Philip Kotler's brother. And um, he got to be friends with the Chinese because he was running the Washington Symphony Orchestra at the time when Nixon had a rapprochement with China and they wanted to make a kind of cultural exchange that wouldn't have any risks and symphony orchestras play music that doesn't have any words, so it was the kind of perfect exchange. So he did something for them, and they said, what would you like us to do for you? And he went and he set up a business advising Chinese companies how to learn marketing skills. Um, so I said to him, that's really interesting, it, it was, but do you also work for Western companies coming into China? And he said, usually not. And I said, well, what would make you do that? And he said, I, most of them come looking for what we can do for them. So what the China can do for them. I want this from China. I want more sales. I want cheaper manufacturing. I want this. So he said, I only talk to the people who, coming, who come in by starting to say, what can we do for That's you? Interesting. Mm -hmm. yep. And he's probably the most influential marketing figure in China among the Chinese companies. And That's the, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So that notion of reciprocity and how you create that sense of 
Yeah, I, I just want to... Adam Grant talks about this with givers and takers, doesn't he? That, that sense of um, you need to be a giver, but not too much of a giver, because that's the way that you start that mutually beneficial re reciprocity that you're talking about, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just a quick question. So linking what you've said there and what Daniel said, can you give uh, an indication or a bit of a feel for how constraints, the language around constraints, um, impacts vocabulary in a business and how that in itself can create change? So I think there is a lot of implicit constraint in the vocabulary that we use in all sorts of areas. So uh, one of the areas we're starting to look at, for instance, is specific kinds of constraints like speed. And in the research world, um, when I was in the research world, there was this phrase about, let's do a quick and dirty piece of research. <laughs> and there's an unconscious association there with speed as meaning um, inferior. Now, clearly, that isn't the case anymore, right? Clients, our clients, they want it to be really fast and it wants it to be really robust. And I think in the kind of businesses that we work in, we have those unconscious associations all around us, around um, uh, if we do this, it will be inferior in some kind of way, or will be compromised in some kind of way. Um, so I think one of the key things one needs to do is um, establish what kind of paths as an organization we've become dependent on, um, the biases that we have in the organization, and they're very often codified in the words that we use. And in Thinking Fast and Slow, Daniel Kahneman talks about identifying biases in, in, in human behavior and the value in giving them names and calling them out because that allows us to see them and talk about them together and therefore do something about them. So I do think that there are, um, as you suggest, all sorts of constraints in our businesses. They're going to be codified in the words and the associations we have. And there needs to be a more explicit stepping back and surfacing what those are, what those might be, what new kinds of ways and frames we should give to them before we can actually move on. Uh, Jen, yes, just behind you. Yeah. Uh, this is a, a lot about creativity. And I, I'm asking you, do you believe that um, const, uh, constraints uh, feed creativity and big budgets limits creativity? In economics, there's a, a very famous expression called the resource curse. And the resource curse applies to economies. Um, and the idea is essentially that if you are rich in a natural resource, gold, oil, um, you know, magnesium, whatever it happens to be, you would have thought that that would benefit the economy as a whole. Um, but in fact, the opposite seems to be true, that people who are very wealthy in a specific resource, with a single exception of the Norwegians, by and large, do much worse. Why? Because they become over-dependent, they don't diversify, uh, it creates factionalism, it creates corruption, it creates politics, and that people who don't have the resources, the natural resources, like Taiwan, funny enough, do proportionately better because it makes them try harder in a more diverse way. I've got a friend in a more informal way who says that if you watch and look at the people who collect an Oscar, and you look at, by and large, what happens to the next film they make, it's usually dreadful. Why? because all the restrictions of budget have taken off them at that point. Wow, Adam's got an Oscar. Whatever you want, mate. Yeah, whatever it costs, just do it. And it's usually dreadful because they're relying on CGI and special effects. So I do think there is a resource curse. And I do think that a lack of resource keeps us hungry and lean and mean. You can't necessarily always, always, always correlate it, but I think there is a relationship between those two things, yeah. Do you, do you as a matter of interest? What do you think? I, I agree. You do, yeah. yeah. What kind of business do you have? I have a public relations company. Okay. So do you find that much of your best work comes when you, are, you have constraints of a certain kind? Absolutely. That's when you have to um, rely on, on the brains in the, in the team, and you have to do something very particular to, to do good for the client. Yeah. One of my interviewees drew a little diagram for me, which was, um, he said, when ambitions are exponentially greater than resources, that's when real innovation and creativity happens, and exactly the same thing that you're talking about. Question. Yes, okay. Um, what about the, the people in your agency? You presented the, the structure according to the five questions. So I understand five departments in the agency. Um, the, the people within the departments, is it the same kind of people in other agencies or did you change the, the, the way you recruit and uh, recruit other kind of people? Yes, yeah, so just to be clear, I don't have an agency based on that. I have a very small consultancy. Um, that doesn't do implementation of any kind. So uh, we push clients to think about what their responses would be to that kind of format. But we are working with agencies and partners like yourselves um, to deliver those solutions. So I'm not building my business around that as well. I'm more a catalyst to get other people to see it that way. Okay, we must leave it there. Thank you.
leave it there because of time. Adam, thank you very much indeed. Wonderful. So thank you so much.